You should have notes somewhere around you uh, in your pew. If not, reach down uh, and reach around. There should be somebody around you that can give you one. It should say, ready to roll the next step. And it shows Joshua 1, 1 through 9. We are on page 169 in your Bibles in the pews. As I said, we're starting a new series this morning called Mission Possible here in the book of Joshua. More looking at Joshua's life. And we've, we've kind of piecemealed Joshua's life over time. But this morning, we're going to look at what it means to be ready to roll. And I think you'll understand that in just a few moments on this mission possible thing. And here is what Joshua 1 says. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the principles and the examples in it. And God, I pray as we begin to open up this narrative in Joshua's life and how you used him and what you did with him, may, may we be able to take the principles that apply to us today and may we allow them to transform our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. 17 years ago, two days from now, everybody probably remembers where they were on September the 11th. I know where I was at. I was actually working in the back room uh, of an office of a funeral home when somebody came in and told me there's a problem. And we were then trying to decide, do we go get our kids? What exactly was happening? And many of you remember the sort of uh, unstable times that it were, and, and as it were, and we were trying to figure out what's next. It was interesting because as the days and the weeks and months went by, we started to hear not only look at the tragedy and all of the stuff that, that had happened, but we looked at some of the heroes in the story. One guy that emerged was, in fact, there was a bunch of them, but one guy that emerged was on, was on United Flight 93. And they were responsible for actually taking down one of the planes so that it probably was on its way to the Capitol and they were able to take it down. Todd Beamer sort of became the, the poster guy for that whole thing and his wife began, she wrote a book and talked about the whole thing and you could actually hear some of the transcripts as they are trying to figure out what they're going to do and finally Todd Beamer says these two words, let's roll and that was it few more transmissions, the plane went down, and they were able to piece together later to realize that that was the moment when all of them took a step it was a defining moment that took a step that meant not only were they were going to sacrifice their lives but they may wind up saving a lot more just by doing that. Those kind of steps are hard to take. Those kind of steps when you're not sure how it's all going to work out are difficult at best. When you think about the fact that you should, people tell you, man, you've got to be ready to go. Go, make the change. You know, go, go out and do this and do that. Start your business. Get another job. All of those things sound really, really cool until it's time to take the step. And then you all of a sudden pause and you go, mm. And sometimes we're not as ready to roll to take that step as we should be. There's a few things that sort of hold us back, I think, from taking the next step, often that may mean destruction, but more than anything else, as we will often see, means blessing. It means maybe saving lives. It means transformation. It can mean, it can mean new territory and new things, as we'll see in a moment. But so much holds us back from taking that step. Sometimes we don't take that step because of hardship, because we know it's going to be hard, because where we've been is hard, and we think if it's hard, 
it's not of God. If it's hard, there's no way that all of this conflict can be something that is going to be good for me. That I have too much conflict. I have, I have too much stuff going on, too much trouble going on in my lives, that, in my life right now. And so because of that, this can't be anything that God is going to use. And so we try to get away from hardship. And then often when we look at the hard things that may, may be ahead, we stop and we go, no, nah, I, man, I think that's going to be too hard. I think it's going to be too hard. And we pause. Hardship. Hardship holds us back from taking that step. The other thing that holds us back is that wonderful thing called fear. <laughs> you know, and you've heard me say it before. People talk about, you know, uh, know what fear, uh, you know, what does it actually may, mean? And we've, we've looked at it before and said, look, it means forget everything and run. Don't you feel like that sometimes? That you, you have this fear and you're like, oh no, not only do you get, you kind of get paralyzed and you not only don't take the step, but you take a few steps back or you may be able even turn and run the other way and say, I don't want any part of that. And fear will paralyze us or it'll cause us to go in sort of a, another direction and run. And we don't know which way is up and, we're, and we're, we're scared and we're timid and we think, I can't go. I can't do this. This is not going to work. What, what if it doesn't work? What if, I, what if I take people out with me? What if, what if, what if? And we get ourselves all wrapped up. And then the next thing you know, there's fear. How many times has fear stopped you from doing something that you know you should do? How many times has the hard stuff stopped you from doing something that you know that you should have done? Or have you ever, have you ever thought this is going to be too hard and you feared something, you've gone ahead and done it and you've gone, what was I worried about? Sometimes that happens too. The other thing that happens that holds us back is surrender. We just give up. Sometimes we just say, that's it, I'm done. And we get content to just stay where we are, kind of go in circles like a hamster on a wheel. The treadmill where you just go, okay, I'm, gonna keep, I'm not going to get anywhere, but I'm just going to keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling. Never going to make any progress, but I'm content to just stay here. Let everybody sort of watch me. And we just surrender and say, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do anymore. The thing is, is that turns the possible mission that God has from, uh, for us into an impossible mission. It turns us, it keeps us from often achieving all that he wants us to achieve and even achieving his best for us. Because we let fear and hardship and surrender hold us back from being all that we can be, from often taking that next step that we need to take. If anybody knew about that, this guy Joshua did. You know, we, we opened up reading Joshua 1, and if you're not careful, you can do what a lot of people do, and they don't read everything. You know, everything is in context. Today, unfortunately, people don't contextualize anything. They just pull something out, and they say, oh, well, the, so-and-so said this, and, and this is what happened, and then they, 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 they put their own assumptions on it, but they don't look at the context. If I read this, just as it says, beginning in verse 1, notice what it says. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant's dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River to land. I'm about to give you that to them and to the Israelites. Wow. How do you like that? The guy, the guy who had gotten the Ten Commandments, the guy who had led the children out of Egypt, God looks at Joshua and said, hey, Moses is dead, let's go. Sounds kind of callous, doesn't it? It would if you don't read the context. And the context of Joshua's life is everything. And by way of introducing this series and our message today, I want to spend a little time talking about this guy named Joshua. And we're going to pull a principle from this and then look at where we, and then come back to where we are right now. Who was Joshua? Joshua, as it said here, was Moses' aid. He was the gopher. Joshua, go get this. Joshua, go do that. Joshua, go here. Joshua, go there. Joshua, Joshua, go out and fight this battle. Joshua, 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 Joshua. He was the guy. And everybody knew that he was, he was Moses' aide. But Joshua wasn't just Moses' aide. We talked about Moses being on Mount Sinai. There was only one other person that was within enough of a distance 
to see what was going on. And guess who it was? It was Joshua. Joshua was, Joshua was the, the first guy to see Moses when he came off of Mount Sinai and see the glory of God showing around his face. He was the second guy to see those, those stone tablets in which the finger of God had etched the Ten Commandments. He was the guy. He was the guy that came down off of the mountain with Moses and he saw what happened as they, had, as they were worshiping another God already. He was, he was the guy. He was one of the, the twelve that Moses had trusted and said, I want you to go into this land and here's what I want you to do. I want all 12 of you to go in and to search the land out and let's come up with a plan because God's going to give us this. He's promised us this land. He promised this land to our father Abraham. We're about to go in and we're about to get it, but we're not going to do this haphazardly. And so if you remember the story, and maybe you don't, so I'll bring you up to speed. All 12 of the spies came back and they were like, hey, uh, Moses said, hey, okay, what'd you find? And, and 10 of them went, Pfft. We ain't going in there. Those people are big. The land's too vast. We don't have the firepower. We don't have the resources. We're never going to be able to take the land. It's not going to happen. And Joshua and another guy named Caleb went, oh, time out. Wait a minute. We, we can do this. We, we can go in there and take this because God's promised it. We can do it. The people started to rise up against Moses and Aaron, and then, and also they started murmuring, the entire group of Israelites, all of them, started murmuring against Joshua and Caleb because they were like, no, we can do it. And the other 10 said, no, we can't. Joshua was the can do guy that said, we can do it. Joshua was with the Israelites, though, when they sinned to the point that God said, okay, that's it. This generation will not enter the promised land. Save two people and their families. Guess who it was? Joshua and Caleb. You know what happened next? The Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. And they went in the circle. Ba-boom. The treadmill. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. And guess who they took on that journey with them? Joshua and Caleb and their family. Have, have you ever had somebody else's actions derail you? And even though you didn't do anything, even though it wasn't your fault, even though you were maybe in the wrong place at the wrong time, their actions co totally derailed you and got you off track for quite a while. You really truly became a victim. That was Joshua. Could you imagine? 40 years. He's the guy that said, we can do this. And instead of them saying, okay, well, Joshua, Caleb, you guys go on in. It's like, you guys come on into Disney World. The rest of you stay out here for 40 years. It's not what happens. 40 years. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. Until that entire generation died. But Joshua was also there. And he saw the guy, the leader, the one that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He saw him disobey God and God said, okay, that's it. Moses, you're not going to get to enter the promised land either. You're only going to get to see it. That leads us up to the immediate context. <laughs> There's a couple of recordings of this in, in Numbers, and we're not, we're not going to go there, but I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you a couple of references a little bit. In Numbers, God, God tells uh, Moses, he goes, okay, Moses, this is it. Um, I want you to go up to the mountain, and you're going to see the promised land. And then he says this to him. I love the way the NIV puts this. He said, after that, you're going to be gathered to your people. Sounds nice, doesn't it? That's a nice way of saying, hey, Moses... After you see this, you're going to die. You gather, doesn't gather to your people sound better? I'm, where are you going? I'm going to be gathered to my people. No, you're going to die. In other words, Moses, this is it. Moses was still concerned about the Israelites. And he says, um, hey God, um, listen. I, uh, um, we know all these people have disobeyed you. I know I disobeyed you. And so, so 
what am I going to do? What, what do we do now? I, I need you to put somebody in charge of them. Somebody, somebody so that they're not like a sheep without a shepherd. So God says to him, I want you to call Joshua, the son of Nun. I want you to call Eliezer, the priest. And I want you to bring him up in front of all of the tribes of Israel. And he says, and I, I want everybody to see that Eliezer's supporting him, that you're supporting him. I want you to lay hands on him and transfer some of your authority because he's going to be the guy. The aide has now become the leader. In other words, he's like, hey, uh, Moses, even though you kind of messed this thing up in the end, I got it. And so we pick up, and I'm just going to read this to you. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 7, it says, Then Moses summoned, you don't have to turn there, Joshua, and said to him in the presence of all of Israel, now listen, listen to this, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people. Notice what he says. Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. And then he says this. He says, Joshua, Moses says this in front of everybody. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never, listen to this, leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Interesting words. And we go on to find the immediate context. Because remember I read in verse 1, it says, okay, God, God knocks on, on Joshua and says, hey, uh, Moses, my servant's dead. It's time for you to go. So I'm like, he dies, let's go. Is that what it sounds like? Well, then we pick up Deuteronomy 34. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Now here it is. The context. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Until the time of weeping and mourning was over. And then it says this in verse 9. Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with spirit of wisdom and Moses. Because of Moses. Because Moses laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Wow. That gives you a different viewpoint, doesn't it? See, here's the thing. God had been preparing Joshua for this moment all of his life. And not only did he prepare him and did he give him the experiences, but he, he put him up in front of the people and he put his mantle on him. And, and Moses said, no, I'm, I'm leaving, but he's the guy. There was a succession plan in Israel. But I want you to notice that it was probably Joshua that led them, listen to this, through that 30 days of mourning. The transition from wandering to what's going to be next. There's always a transition. I'm always, always concerned about us Westerners and how we handle, handle grief. You get three days off. If you're with a corporation, if you're lucky, maybe you get five. And then you're done. Unless you take more time. Like, okay, that's it. We're done. They took 30 days of appointed mourning for, their gr for the grief for a leader. They didn't try to replace it right away. Even though they knew who was replacing him. They stopped. And so then we pick up the story. Back in Joshua 1. And here it is. And let's, let's look at it now. So this should give us some context. So God says to, to Joshua in verse 2. After he says my servant's dead. He said I'm about to give you the land. He, now watch what he says in verse 3. I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses. Did you catch that? I'm going to give you every place that you step. He said I've already given you this. But you're not going to get it until you take the step. It's not going to be yours until you move on out. You could, it, in other words, it's like, it would be like you have this beautiful house and you've closed on it, but you never opened it up and moved in. It's like, it's like getting the new keys to a car and you never drive it off the dealership lot. He says, look, it's yours, but you better go drive it off the lot. You better go move in. So he says, I'm going to give you every place that you step. Now, some people like to take this and say, oh, the territory is mine wherever I step. And that's not what he, he's telling that to Joshua. Because he was building a nation. But notice then what he says. 
He says, everywhere that you step, but wait, here's your territory. And then he lays out what the boundaries are. Can I tell you something? God always has boundaries on what he's calling you to do. He's always got boundaries. He told, he told Joshua, he goes, here's the boundaries. Here's what you're going to do. And every place you step within this boundaries, when you step out and you take action and you conquer it, it's going to be yours. But you've got to do something. You can't just sit and pray. You can't just sit and mourn. You've had your time of mourning. Now it's time to take action. It's, it's not time to pray. It's time to take action. It's not time to have another meeting. It's time to take action. And so notice what happens. Then he says in verse 5, here it is. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. That's a pretty good promise. They're going to come up against you and guess what? They'll never win. I was with Moses. I'm going to be with you. And then he says this. I will never leave you or forsake you. I love the way the Hebrew renders this. It's like, I will never abandon you or drop you. You ever been dropped before? You ever had a call drop? Boom. Nothing. That's it. You're done. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be holding you. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let go of you, Joshua. I'm not, I'm not going to drop you. And notice, notice the, the same, the similar words that God uses as Moses told Joshua earlier in Deuteronomy that I read. So then, then, then three things, there, there's like three commands that he gives. And I want to spend a moment on these because often people use these commands as life verses. They'll, they'll use them and say, oh, have I not commanded you to be strong? And, and we think it like, the, the Lord your God is with you. So I want us to look at this for a moment because three th he says three times, be strong and courageous. Look at verse 6. He goes, listen, Joshua, I'm never going to leave you, forsake you, so be strong and courageous. Now, I want to stop for a moment and ask you a question. Have you noticed the theme? In Deuteronomy, Moses says, now Joshua, don't get discouraged. Don't get dismayed. Don't give up. The Lord's with you. Be courageous. Be strong. The Lord's with you. Three times in verses 6 through 9, God says to him, be strong and courageous. Why do you think he's saying that? Probably because Moses, or, or rather Joshua, is displaying some characteristics of now discouragement and not knowing what to do next. Now, I don't know about you, but I won't be too, too harsh on Joshua. He had been disappointed a lot. You know how old he is right now? 80. Could you imagine? Now he lived 110. That would be the equivalent of, I'm going to be 55 very soon. That would be the equivalent then of me at, 80, at 55 having 30 more years of ministry on my hands and starting something totally new. At 55. He's 85. There's a, there's a good chance, or, or, or 80, so there's a good chance when you're that 80 to 85, even, even though he's, you know, it was a little bit different, it, it's an awesome task. He's watched the Israelites disappoint throughout his life. He watched them, when they came out of Egypt, start murmuring against God and say, we're better off going back to Egypt. We're better off in slavery. We're better off back here than we are going to be out here with the unknown. We're, we're at least comfortable here. We knew what to expect when we got up in the morning. We knew exactly what we had to do. Why do we want to go out and do this? This is, this is ridiculous. Joshua watched all that. So now he's thinking, that's just great. Moses has, has failed. The people have failed. And i got to take this new group in. And so three times... God says to him, first, be strong and courageous because he says, you will see these, help these, lead these people to inherit the land. Remember the promise that I gave to Abraham? You're going to be the guy that's going to see it happen. And how many years ago had that happened with Abraham? You're going to be the guy that's going to see this happen. So please, my promise is going to come true. It's going to come true with you. You're going to see it. You're going to be the one that's going to make it happen. So he says, you're going to watch it happen. So that promise. And then he says again, be strong and courageous. Now here's the next verse. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from the right to the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. And then this verse that a lot of people like to quote. 
Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and then you'll be successful. The prosperity theologians love to get a hold of this. You'll be prosperous and you'll be successful if you just meditate on the word of God. You'll have anything that you want. First of all, he didn't say you're going to have anything you want. He said, Joshua, you're going to be successful. And by the way, Joshua, of course, didn't have the whole Bible. He had some of the writings of Moses and some of the laws. And all, all God would say to Joshua is, look, he says, look, hey, Joshua, guess what? When, God, when, when Moses went my way, it was the right way, and it went well. He says, but whenever he turned a different way, they got themselves in trouble. So just if you just will follow the path that, we've laid, that I've laid out for you, and you follow what Moses has laid out, and don't go to the left, don't go to the right, think about this, keep it foremost in your mind, it's, it's the plan for success, you'll success, you'll, you'll, you'll be successful, you'll prosper in the land, you're going to get the promise. If you just do things the way that I've laid out, but don't turn to the left or right. You already saw where, where Moses did that. So then next, notice what happens again. Verse 9, he then says it again. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Then he says this, don't be discouraged because now for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Guess what? I've given you a plan. I've given you a promise. And my very presence is going to go with you. So now let's roll. It's go time. Now, why was it go time? Why? Here's the thing that I want you to see, and I have one little line in your notes, and here's what I want you to think about, because this is how this kind of truth applies to us. That, that when you are only ready to roll, and you think about it, when God readies you for the roll, R-O-L-E. Think about that. God readies you for the roll that he has for you. Let me think about this. Talk, let me say that again. God readies you for the role that he has for you. He said, but wait, 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 wait a minute. You mean the role where I'm at right now? Yep, he's readying you for a role that he has for you. See, because that hardship that you're going through, the hardship that Joshua went through, what did he have in that hardship? God was preparing him in the midst of the hardship for the role that he had for him. In those, in those moments of, of, of fear, God was, was, was readying him for the role that he had for him. And even in the moments when Joshua was ready to give up, God's like, wait, you, don't, you can't see this right now, but I am readying you for the role that I have for you. Whatever you're going through right now, God can use it. He didn't put you there, but you're where you're at right now and I guarantee you that he is going to ready you for the role that he has for you and what's going to wind up happening is you may not see it right now but at least it gives you a different perspective right now because later on you're going to look back and go got it got it I see it there are things that early in my life that made absolutely no sense to me that I look back now you go Okay, now I got it. But at the time, are you kidding me? God readies you for the role that he has for you. You know what the tough thing is? Is the wandering. The tough thing is going in circles. The tough thing is the impatience. The tough thing is the tough thing is is being the victim when somebody else does something to you and you you didn't do anything at all and now you feel like you've been derailed. That's the tough thing, but God takes that and he readies you for the role that he has for you. Right where you're at right now, God readies you for the role he has for you. And by the way, I love this. If you're older, whatever that means in our time frame now, it, if you are still breathing, God is still readying you for the role that he has for you. It's not over till it's over. If I was Joshua, I would have been going, huh? Come on, man, I'm 80 years old. Will you leave me alone? You know, really? Can you, can you let somebody else do this at this point? Come on, I've had my time. I've put up with these people. They've wandered. They've complained. I've had to do this. I've seen, I've seen my stuff, God. 
I mean, really, I'm only the second guy that saw, I was the first guy, the second guy after Moses to see the Ten Commandments and the, and the etched stone. And, and I was the first guy to see his glory. And I, I've seen you do some pretty incredible things. And I've watched, you know, I've watched you part the waters. And I've, I've seen you be faithful. So I'm good. Why don't you just get one of these other guys to come along and do this? And God goes, nope. He was ready for him to go. And here's the thing. Joshua knew that it was time. You know why? Because that's what people go, well, how do I know when it's time, when it's go time? Well, think about it. That's a, God's using the experience. But somebody comes along and grabs you after all that experience and says, you're the one. This is why ordination is important. Education and ministry, all those things are important. We got a lot of people that wake up one day and go, hey, I think I'll be a pastor. Well, they, hey, I think I'll be an attorney. Really? It's not quite that easy. Well, God called me. Yeah, but if you don't want to take any time at all to prepare, there's an ego problem. You've got to prepare. So you can't just pull it out one day and go, well, hey, I think I'm going to do this. I guarantee you there's people that have said, no, no, he, no, this person's got some talent. This person's got some leadership. This person's got this. They've, they've got that. And suddenly then a group of people come together. And that's why even in ordination today, they do this, this laying on of hands. It's not any kind of transfer of power. It's more of, a, it's more of saying, okay, you're, yes, you're ready. You've got, a, you've got a mentor that says, no, you're ready. And all of a sudden, at that moment, after all the experience, and, and somebody says, no, you're, you're ready to go. And there's, there's other people that are saying, yes, you've got this gift, and yes, you could do this. And all of a sudden, just at that moment, something intersects a need at that moment with that experience. And God says, now it is time. Let's roll. Please understand, whatever is God is doing right now, he is readying you for the role that he has for you. And you never know how long it's going to take and what he's really preparing you for. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been, um, been uh, once again sort of interacting with Beth Moore. Some of you know who Beth Moore is on Twitter. Just sort of back and forth on a couple of different things. Nothing major, but just, you know, a, a very, very good conversation. But it was interesting because Beth Moore um, recently came to the forefront as a voice in the evangelical church. For years, Beth Moore has sort of done her thing um, as a, a, a woman teacher. Now, in Baptist circles, that was never good. Because women weren't allowed to preach. Now, you can sit here and argue this all day, and, and you can, you know, try to uh, engage me in a conversation about it, whatever you want, but you'll see the point that I'm making. In fact, Beth said in one of her tweets that one, at one time that she was speaking, asked to speak in a church on a Sunday morning. You, you'll love this. Speaking in the church on a Sunday morning. But because the pastor didn't know what to do with it because it was a woman that was going to be teaching and men were going to be present. This is how he, when he introduced her, he says, well, uh, folks, he says, we have Beth Moore with us today. And he says, now, uh, we're going to let Beth, we are going to let Beth speak to the women and us men are going to listen in. <laughs> and then the Me Too and the Church Too movement happened. Uncovering all the, a lot of the, the sexism that had happened in the church. I know anytime a movement happens, people take it and they go too far the other way. But then you come back to the middle and you go, okay, there's some things probably that we need to change. And there's, there's been people that have been like so uh, off the wall with this movement. But Beth Moore all of a sudden has come out as a sane, reasonable voice to saying, you know what? We got to change how we're interacting with each other in the church. She's not saying, I want to be ordained in the Baptist church. But she's actually had some of these same men that have come back and apologized to her. She has taken a role that Nobody would have ever thought that it would have been Beth Moore that would have been the person that did that. Because you know what Beth Moore did when that, when that pastor said that? She got up and she taught anyway. You know what she kept doing? She kept ministering anyway. She kept teaching anyway. She kept doing her stuff anyway. And years and years. I think she's almost 60, maybe above 60 years old now. 
She's been doing this since she was in her 30s. And finally, somebody has said, you know what? She's got a point. She's got a point. You never know how God is readying you for the role that he has for you. But wherever you're at right now, he can take it and ready you for what's next. Let's pray.